Okay, so the write out the title. Is that big enough? It's good. Okay, great. So um, what I'm going to talk about uh, has different aspects, um, and I'm going to try to touch on on several different types of things. Um, I understand it's the end of a long day, so I, I hope, well, okay, anyway, I hope it's entertaining. So what I'm going to talk about is a kind of um, report on an ongoing project that's joint with uh, David Benz V. Um, but um, I'm also going to mention um, some uh, joint work uh, with some other people who are here, uh, like uh, Pangui Lee. Um, uh, Tolly Pragel and Ji Wei Yun. Um, so, uh, unfortunately, Tolly Pragel is not here. He's one of the world's great derived algebraic geometry consultants, but unfortunately, he's gone on to consult in other pastures. So he's. Um, it's, uh, it's a shame. Okay, so uh, let me uh, tell you the overview of uh, what I'm going to talk about. So overview, uh, sorry, I kind of uh, tell you what, what the, the program will be. So the first part will be a kind of overview, and then the second part will be some report on some spectral tools that are useful. This is going to be a discussion about coherent sheaves in derived algebraic geometry. And then the third part will be specific to genus one, uh, genus one tools and I'll talk about some kind of uniformization. Okay. Great. So, um, maybe that's too big. Maybe I should use the boards more efficiently. Let's see if I can remember how this goes. Okay. Okay, so um, so the the overview. So let's start part one, kind of overview. Um, so I'll just start with the setting, um, which is going to be uh, geometric Langlands. So um, so I'll write the obligatory uh, equation on the board, which is that if we have some curve, we can look at d modules on bungee of C, and probably uh, soon enough we'll all know that this is equivalent to incoherent sheaves with nilpotent singular support um, on local systems for the dual group. Okay, so um, okay, so what I'd like to do is uh, um, ask of this this purported equivalence or this expected equivalence. I'd like to ask for it to. Uh, to change a bit so that we're, what we're talking about turns out to be topological in C. So I'm going to make an ansatz that I'd like to pursue, which is that we'd like, like a version, so find a version uh, that is topological in C. Okay. So what I mean by topological in C is that as you move the curve, See in the in the moduli of curves that everything you see is locally constant as you move in the moduli of curves. Okay, so these categories know about which curve you're on, but uh, you could hope that there'd be a version that's topological in C. Um, so this means kind of locally constant in the moduli of curves. 
Okay, so um, there are several motivations for this that maybe I'll mention. I mean, one overarching one is that there are various versions of geometric Langlands that physicists talk about and suggest that something like this um, might be interesting to consider as well. Okay, so let me just do uh, an example of what I might mean, where everything you, you can understand everything. Let me just consider the case of G a torus. Okay, so, um, so I'm not going to change the usual uh, automorphic moduli. So in this case, we're looking at the automorphic moduli is just the, the Picard, T Picard, um, which you can identify with the Jacobian, the zeroth part, um, uh, C sub T, uh, cross the classifying space of T, cross the coate lattice of, of possible degrees of T bundles. Okay? So this is the kind of moduli that's appearing on the left-hand side. But what I would like to do is change the traditional uh, moduli of Durham local systems and instead consider Betty local systems. So let's change, consider Betty local systems for the dual torus. Um, so this has a similar uh, kind of presentation as uh, maps from pi 1 of C to the dual torus, cross the classifying space of the dual torus, cross a kind of uh, derived thickening uh, spec of a symmetric algebra um, on T shifted into degree minus one. Okay. So this is a kind of derived stack um, in the sense that we've heard about uh, in, in the morning lectures um, where the derived structure is exactly this. Okay, it's, it's coming, the non-trivial derived structure. Okay, and now what equivalence would I want to get out of this, this setup? I would want the following that, or you can establish the following, that um, sheaves on pick T of C with no potent singular support. So I don't want to be too precise at the moment about what I mean by sheaves. So I have in mind constructible sheaves, but not necessarily with finite dimensional stalks. Okay, so uh, in this case, because the nil potent singular support condition essentially forces such sheaves to be local systems, you can think of this as kind of a derived category of locally constant sheaves, but without imposing any kind of constraints on the, on the, on the fibers. Okay, and this is equivalent to um, end coherent sheaves with nil potent singular support on this Betty look check of C. Um, and here, just like here, this forced these to be local systems. So this is like local systems. Here, the no potent singular support condition forced these to be, in fact, quasi-coherent. I mean, made it equivalent to quasi-coherent. So let me just describe explicitly what these categories are in this situation uh, before continuing on. So in this situation, these categories are, um, can be thought of as lambda t graded um, modules over modules over um, k adjoin pi one c tensor lambda t tensor um, that algebra sim. Okay. Okay, so I don't want to spend uh, more time unless anyone has a question, but I just wanted a kind of explicit example. So this, yeah, question. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, a kind of derived category of local systems on on, uh, yeah, locally constant. Yeah, so, right, so, so the only kind of, I don't know, well, okay, there's not much content to, to what's going on here, except as you say that, um, so a local system here, right, is just a, well, I mean, there's a regular local system, if you like, which is the universal local system whose fibers are pi one of C tensor lambda T, and that's the that's functions on this. Yeah. Okay. Okay.
is fun. Okay, so um, so now let me just make a wild um, conjecture. Oh, maybe just make a comment, which is these both of these categories are, are just dependent upon C, or the topology of C, uh, in the sense that they both depend just on pi one of C. So it's a kind of a version that doesn't see the algebraic geometry of C. Okay, so here's a Betty Langland's conjecture. Uh, which is now you just boldly um, uh, substitute this in in the general conjecture. So you ask that sheaves with no potent singular support on uh, bun G of C uh, would be equivalent to end coherent sheaves with no potent singular support on the Betty moduli. Okay, so, um, and just like in the kind of Durham setting, you expect this to be compatible with all symmetries. So, um, so what I'd like to, to hopefully get to today is, um, is uh, C being genus one. Okay, so that's kind of the goal. Okay, so, um, questions? I don't know, maybe, maybe some experts could, Dennis says no. Okay, so, so I guess my, po <laughs> my point of view is that, um, all right, well, depending on what kinds of objects you like, some of the most kind of interesting objects fit into this subject just as well as they do the kind of Durham story. So you're not maybe paying too much of a price, and I'm about to sort of tell you maybe some extra structures that help you in this setting, okay? So, um, okay. So, okay, all I'm asking you here is to, I don't want to get into the functional analysis, I mean, we could talk a bit more, but all I'm asking you to believe in is that there's a category of constructible sheaves with no potent singular support where I don't insist on, I mean, the, the, um, the stalks to satisfy some finite con finiteness condition. So we could talk about the compact objects in these categories, but I don't want to, uh, sorry. I mean, just, what do you mean? Yeah, usual, I don't know what you mean, usual, yeah, constructible sheaves. Um, I mean, I would have told you what I expect to be, you know, here there's an obvious small category of compact objects, and so there is here as well, but I just don't. Uh, okay, so let me tell you um, one uh, beautiful uh, structure you have in this Betty setting. So here's a kind of a strategy for, for attacking this kind of a conjecture that maybe is not, well, okay, some version of this must exist in the other setting, but in any case, uh, and that's to pursue some kind of Verlinda formula. Okay, so what we'd like to do is we'd like to take the curve C to the boundary of the moduli and express the categories that we see here in this conjecture in terms of smaller curves, okay? So I'm going to kind of explain as far as we've gotten in, that, in, that, uh, in this game today. So let me sort of, I don't know, just draw some pictures. Um, so suppose here's my, my curve, okay? So um, what I want to do is I want to, uh, you know, highlight some, some cycles on the curve and to generate the curve to where I get um, a bunch of genus zero curves with some markings kind of glued together. Okay, so here there are four genus zero curves and two of them have uh, uh, two markings and two of them have three markings, okay? And then I could kind of normalize this, so this is degenerate, and then I could also normalize and just pull them apart. Okay. Okay, so, <clears throat> 
So there's a local picture that governs this kind of, uh, so this is a kind of a global, global picture we'd like to do, but there's a well-known local picture that governs this kind of geometry, which is the following. Um, anywhere where I've drawn one of these cycles, you can think of a small annulus around that cycle. Okay? And you can imagine degenerating this annulus to a nodal, just a nodal curve. Okay, and then pulling it apart. Okay, so, <clears throat> yeah, what's the best way to, um, okay, so, Okay, so this picture of curves degenerating has a kind of well-known interpretation once one passes to G-bundles. Okay, so let me just remind you or, or tell you what that is. So, um, so this, um, this picture of, of this local picture, you can think of gauge symmetries that you would see if you looked at bundles on, on those curves. And what you would see is um, the kind of wonderful compactification or asymptotic degeneration of the loop group. Okay, so what you would see is if you looked at just maps from the annulus to G, you would see a loop group. Okay, I don't want to be precise what kind, some kind of holomorphic loop group maybe, or depending on your setup, maybe some kind of formal loop group. And uh, you would see the degeneration to the kind of boundary of the wonderful compactification, which looks something like LG modulo, uh, say, unipotent part of an Iwahori, and take the product over T. Okay. And then, of course, you can, you, can, um, you can pull them apart if you like, okay? So, um, so this picture has a kind of, uh, kind of concrete interpretation in terms of bundles, and it, uh, so one can expect that there should be some kind of very nice picture in terms of moduli. So I'd like to just make a comment, kind of comment about a kind of TFT interpretation, since David Benz-V has talking about that, and this is, a, this is a kind of a nice moment where TFT kind of uh, helps you understand what's going on. So you can, uh, let me turn the picture. So I have this kind of local picture, and I want to get to this local picture. And at some point in time, I pass through this local picture. Okay. So this is just, if you were to imagine, you could imagine a three-manifold, so some cobordism. So a three-manifold, a three-cobordism, <laughs> that looks just constant, except it has one more singularity as you cross through this, this location. So it has, so with a single more singularity of, you know, type, Something like one minus one minus one, I don't know. Okay? So when you have such a cobordism, you expect then to see some kind of uh, relationship, I mean, some kind of uh, map between what you've assigned here and what you've assigned here. Okay? And so this is what we're going to be trying to study. Okay. So. Um, just continuing with this theme, I'd like to. C, just make a list of the atomic building blocks um, of, that you see when you, uh, when you do this game. So let me just make a list. Kind of, uh, sort of the atomic building blocks. Okay, so <clears throat> when you do this kind of degeneration, what can your genus zero situation look like? So it can look like um, the simplest 
would be just one marked point. I mean, I guess you could start with genus zero and never have any marked points, but in any case, this is the, the simplest thing you could see. Um, you could also see genus zero with two marked points. And both of these are kind of well understood uh, situations. This is um, what you might, the sort of category that you assign to such a thing is the kind of regular, uh, regular bimodule over the affine Hecke category. So we'll come back to this. I'm still sort of in the overview part of the talk, but this is, um, this is what you would, you would see. And here you would see the kind of uh, lattice module for affine Hecke category. OK, so these categories and their Langlands uh, kind of theory are, are uh, well understood, and amazing work. So, going starting with uh, Kaj Dan Lustig, Kaj Dan Lustig, but then put in categorical form by Bezru Kovnikov. So these building blocks, Bezru Kovnikov. Uh, so these building blocks are, are, if you can reduce to these, um, they're they're well understood, at least by experts. Um, okay. But now there are some other building blocks that I'm not going to sort of say anything about, but are, are, are interesting in their own right. So one is a kind of trivalent picture, a kind of, I don't know what to call it, trivalent regular, or I don't know, regular, let me say this, regular trimodule for the affine Hecke category. And I'm not going to say anything about this, but uh, Ji Wei will say, will explain some simple case that um, can be understood. So, um, and I want to just mention one other that's near and dear to my heart, which is um, if you do this story starting with Riemann surfaces, this is what you'll bubble off at the end of the day. But if you start with non-oriented surfaces, then you'll, at some point, perhaps bubble off RP2. So I don't know how to draw RP2. You'll so this is supposed to be a picture of RP2. Um, so at some point, you'll bubble off RP2 with, with, uh, with one point. And uh, this is um, kind of a non-oriented uh, module. And I won't say anything about it, but this has uh, kind of an important role to play in the theory of real groups. OK, so, um, okay, so those are the, the, the building blocks. So the strategy in this Betty Langlands game might be, if you follow kind of Verlinda formula uh, strategy, is that you're going you're gonna to degenerate your curve into smaller pieces. You're going to understand these smaller pieces, and then you're going to reassemble the curve. So let me um, state what would be the kind of uh, Verlinda conjecture in this situation. Um, so Betty, this is a lot of names. Betty Langlands Verlinda conjecture. Okay. Uh, okay. So here's a kind of a, a rough formulation, and I'll make it more precise in a moment. Um, so the Betty Langlands uh, Verlinda conjecture would be that this automorphic moduli sheaves with nilpotent singular support on bungee of C um, can be obtained or results from gluing the um, you know, sheaves uh, on bungee of these atoms. Um, with respect to the affine Heck algebra. Or affine Heck category. Um, OK, so let me just say a little bit more precisely what I mean by this. Um, and we'll see, we'll see much, we'll see more examples in a little while. So, um, so what does it mean? I guess I should, I'm going to try to say something about what it means to glue two things. So this is kind of a standard algebraic picture. So if um, so, gluing, i.e., co-limits. So let's say um, 
A is some algebra, so um, associative algebra. So I don't care where it is. I'll have in mind in this kind of situation that it's a monoidal category. Um, but you can, uh, well, you can ask, you can ask uh, kind of this story. You can make this definition anywhere. Um, okay, so A is an algebra, and M is say a right module, and N is a left module. Um, okay, so then you can form their tensor product, okay, which um, is just, well, in some situations is just given by the, the as the co-limit of the kind of standard uh, kind of simplicial diagram where you take the kind of naive or absolute tensor and then you look at the actions the two possible actions there and co-equalize them. Okay, so in other words, this is kind of the universal category in which you've made the action of A on M and the action of A on N uh, the same as a kind of universal quotient. Okay. Um, <clears throat> okay, so what I mean by gluing is that you would look at uh, Sheaves on these atoms, they carry the action of affine Hecke categories at all these marked points. Okay? And then you would ask, is sheaves on your original bungee given by you know, gluing via that kind of combinatorial diagram? Okay, okay, so, um, okay so the reason I stated this as a, um, just on the kind of automorphic side is because it's a theorem on the spectral side. So let me just state a theorem. Um, that gives you, I mean, I don't know, gives you a reality check that this, this whole, oh, maybe I should have, well, okay. Gives you a reality check that this whole program might actually work. So, um, so the theorem is that, um, uh, well, it's exactly this on the spectral side. So coherent sheaves with no potent singular support on Betty Loke G check of C um, results from such gluing. Okay, so I'm not going to be I'm not going to be precise now. I'll in the second part of my talk in just a few minutes I'll talk about you know what the affine Hecke category looks like and formulate this a little bit more precisely. Okay, so. So if you, okay, so what does this mean? This means that you can sort of prove the Betty Langlands kind of in two different ways. I mean, you could prove it directly, just establish Betty Langlands, or you could establish this Verlinda conjecture and then just establish Betty Langlands for these pieces. Okay, so, um, okay. so I'm gonna finish my, my overview just with some motivation about genus one specifically. Have I kind of lost everyone? I don't know. End of a day? No, it's okay. All right. I think we're all jet lagged, but so it's not. Maybe it's not an excuse for the speaker. Okay. Um, so some motivation. Just the final part of my overview. So motivation um, is specifically genus one. And here the. So I've sort of told the story about how we got into this game kind of backwards in that I made it look like it was a story we were interested in about geometric Langlands. That's, I guess that's partially true. But the real motivation was we wanted to understand what an affine character sheaf is. So I'm going to tell you, I'm going to remind you a little bit about character sheaves. I'm going to explain to you how this, the, a particular realization of affine character sheaves fits into this, uh, this framework. So, um, so this is kind of pursuing, pursuing, uh, affine character sheaves. Okay, so let me remind you uh, what Lustig's character sheaves are. Lustig's character sheaves, at least just in a way that fits into the story I'm telling now. So <clears throat> character sheaves, what I'll mean by a character sheaf is it consists of a, some full subcategory of sheaves on G mod G the adjoint quotient, okay? 
So I'll tell you exactly which full subcategory in a moment, um, but uh, let me just remind you of, um, of uh, Lustig's original construction. So these are the image of the horocycle correspondence. So let me explain what I mean by that. So the horocycle correspondence is um, it's what you get by taking G mod N mod N mod T, and then looking at G mod B and G mod G. And you start to get, a, to get character sheaves. Maybe I can raise this up. To get character sheaves, you start with um, the, the HECA category. HG is the HECA category of, say, bimonodromic sheaves here. And you follow through the correspondence. You pull back and push forward. So EQ. Uh, so you do, say, P upper star, Q lower shriek, and you get character sheaves. OK. So. Oh. Hmm. <laughs> it's tricky. <laughs> okay, and so, um, okay, so I want to make some comment about this horocycle correspondence, which is that it is very closely related to something we've already seen earlier, which is the wonderful compactification or asymptotic degeneration. So um, just to say that this, the, uh, the adjoint functor, I guess the way I've written it, the adjoint functor would be uh, uh, p lower star, q upper shriek, um, uh, is the same thing as, as kind of nearby cycles uh, as you go to the boundary, at the boundary of the wonderful compactification. So just to draw the picture again, the wonderful compactification uh, does something that starts at G. And as you approach the boundary, you see uh, G mod n cross g mod, say, n minus uh, mod t. And if you divide out by g everywhere, you get, exactly, uh, you get exactly the kind of n terms of this. I guess I switched it around. <clears throat> OK, so, um, okay. so OK, so now let me just uh, remind you of a couple of of uh, further facts about, uh, about character sheaves. One is uh, Mirkovich and Vilonin's characterization that character sheaves are, in fact, exactly sheaves with no potent singular support on G mod G. And the second thing is the kind of gluing characterization. So I won't spend a lot of time on this, but I just want to state it so it motivates what's to come. So the gluing characterization is that character sheaves are the same thing as the Hochschild homology of the Hecke category. So it's the Drinfeld cocenter of HG, which just means you look at HG as a regular bimodule and you tensor it with itself over the two copies acting. OK. OK, so just to, to pause for a second. So I'm going to now go back to the affine setting. But here in this, in the kind of finite dimensional setting, um, we just see that character sheaves can be obtained by some process that we discussed before. And um, 
well, also have this kind of algebraic characterization. OK, so um, great, thanks. Where did I? Why did I write? Because that's the d definition of the Drinfeld cocenter. Yeah. So I, d I don't know. I don't know what to spend time on. Well, <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. May I mean, maybe a better thing to have sort of spent time on was to explain that this kind of gluing has a is kind of exactly analogous to the kind of gluing we want to do in this situation. Um, I mean, I, well, I guess I kind of said something about this. OK, um, so now let's go back to the affine setting and um, try to see what, what this kind of, um, what this, what this would, would motivate. So, um, so, OK, so back to the affine setting. OK, so now, instead of starting with the, this HECA category of bimonodromic bi sheaves, we'll start with the affine HECA category. So affine HECA category of bimonodromic uh, sheaves on um, LG mod I0. Maybe I use zero again. I don't know. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so, oh, I guess modulo T. Okay. So, <coughs> with this, um, with the gluing characterization in mind, you could make the following definition. Um, you could define affine character sheaves. Uh, that's right. Character sheaves G F to be the Drinfeld co-center of the affine HECA category. OK, so this is a kind of, I mean, I don't know, it, it's just an algebraic construction. After you make the definition, you can go home. Um, I mean, or you can, you can just kind of formally play with it. So the key, uh, I mean, the key you utility or useful, I mean, what would be useful here is, to, of course, to, to describe it. So um, maybe I do this. So describing it as a special case of the kind of Betty Langland's Verlinda conjecture I stated, which says that sheaves on bungee C can result from gluing. So um, so. Kind of special case of this this uh, this conjecture uh, is sort of conjecture, sort of gluing conjecture, sort of Verlinda conjecture in genus one is that uh, this category of affine character sheaves is the category of sheaves with nilpotent singular support on bun G of an elliptic curve. OK, so, um, so I don't know, maybe it's all scattered in my head, so I can't imagine that it's, it's, it's clear. But um, if you just literally take this conjecture and combine it with the definition of, of Hochschild homology, you will get in, in genus 1, you'll get this, this, uh, this conjecture. OK, so. Um, OK, so uh, as a consequence, um, thanks to uh, Bezrukovnikov's Langlands duality, the local Langlands duality, this, uh, this Verlinda conjecture, so the genus 1 uh, Verlinda conjecture, 
would imply the genus one Betty Langlands conjecture. Okay, so you can kind of, at this point, you can, um, you can forget, if you like, about uh, geometric Langlands or Betty Langlands or whatever. You can just decide that your game is trying to relate the affine Hecke category to, um, to, uh, to character sheaves on the elliptic moduli. So I just want to make a comment that the reason that the, the, this, uh, I mean, the reason this case is easier than the general case is that you only see the kind of regular bimodule. You don't see any trimodules. So the reason this is kind of something that we can appeal just to this is that it, so only atoms are bivalent, not trivalent. OK. so. Yes, um, <laughs> so uh, I'll talk uh, more about that. Um, I mean, I already stated a theorem that said that there's gluing. Uh, oh, I see. Yeah, I already stated a, a, a theorem that there's gluing on the spectral side. So any gluing you want to do on the spectral side, you can do. I'll maybe state that specific gluing. Um, what time did I start? It's been about 45 minutes. It's felt, it's felt like hours, right? What's that? <laughs> it's okay. Okay, so that's the end of the overview. So now, the sort of, if you fell asleep, uh, I welcome you back. Um, uh, what I'm going to talk now about in the second part is just some kind of derived algebraic geometry and coherent sheaves. Uh, sort of talk about some tools, some useful theorems, and uh, ways of thinking. Uh, and then in the third part, I'll, I'll say something about genus one. So, um, okay. OK, so what I'd like to do is explain to you how to think or why, I mean, sort of, I don't know, explain to you this uh, spectral gluing, um, sort of what is behind it and how to, how to think about it. OK. So. Part two, so coherent sheaves in derived algebraic geometry. OK, so just the kind of orientation or the point of view is going to be, um, we're going to think about sort of categorified uh, harm, uh, f functional analysis, categorified functional analysis. I'm not going to say anything sophisticated, but I think it's useful just to say those words. OK. so. Um, Let's start with x, a reasonable derived stack. Um, so I'm not going to spend any time on what, what reasonable means. Um, well, I guess maybe good, good to say something reasonable is something like uh, you know, a nice variety mod an affine group. That's, that's, a, that's a kind of stand in for reasonable. OK, so you can assign to it. Um, uh, two natural things. You can assign to it the commuter of algebra of functions. And you can also assign to it distributions. So uh, distributions is not a commuter of algebra, but it's a module over, over functions. OK, and now these two have categorified analogs. So um, for functions, we can think about perfect complexes on x. Okay, so this is a symmetric monoidal category. Okay. And for distributions, we can think about coherent sheaves on X. This is a module category. So to make this kind of analogy uh, kind of more correct, you should probably think of these as distributions with uh, not necessarily compactly supported. So let me state um, a kind of a theorem that that uh, gives you, I mean, kind of justifies this dictionary. So let's let x be over some 
S, some smooth base, and uh, let's have this be a proper map. Um, okay, so then there's the following theorem, which uh, kind of orients you. It says that if you look at functors from, say, perfect sheaves on X, so you look at functors from functions on X to functions on the base that are, say, linear over functions on the base, this is exactly distributions. Okay. And also you have the kind of reflexivity that functions from distributions to functions, uh, sorry, yeah, functors, sorry. So these are exact functors that are linear over perfect complexes are again perfect complexes on X. Okay, so, <clears throat> Okay, so yeah, maybe uh, I should make some comments about big versus small categories at some point. Everything I'm gonna say is gonna take place in the world of small categories. Some of the statements you can replace with end in various places, some of them you can't. Um, so, um, but I, uh, okay, anyway, I'm gonna stick with the small categories wherever I can. Okay, so. Okay, so these theorems are in the um, they're in the realm of uh, when I say functional analysis of the idea that you would represent uh, integral transforms or maps, but I mean you would represent uh, linear maps as integral transforms. You would represent uh, you know a various uh, various things by um, by kernels and integration against the kernels. So let me state a kind of uh, there are kind of many, many, uh, many variations on this theme. On this theme, so uh, Bertrand is the, I don't know, the, the expert on these things. I don't know if he's here now, but in any case, um, if anyone's interested, we should, we should talk to him. Uh, but one kind of natural uh, generalization that I'd like to, to mention is the following theorem. Um, which says that if I have two uh, reasonable uh, derived stacks, x and x prime, over again a smooth base, okay, so this is going to be just a generalization of what I, what I did up there, um, and let's say this is proper, then, um, then we have the following, that uh, the functors, exact functors that are linear over the base from, so let me, let me assume yeah, well, okay, let me assume that these, these guys are smooth just for, just for convenience, um, just for sanity. Then linear functions, uh, functors, from perfect complexes to perfect complexes are the same thing as coherent sheaves uh, on the derived fiber product. So this kind of theorem is a kind of prime motivation for a derived algebraic geometry. So why would you ever want to form a kind of derived limit at some point in your life? And well, one reason is you might want to, to have a theorem like this hold. Um, okay, so this theorem says that, um, that you can represent all functors from perfect complexes to perfect complexes that are linear over a perfect complex, not in terms of a perfect complex, but in terms of a coherent one. Um, so let me give you a kind of favorite example, one, the one that'll be relevant as we go along, um, or as we conclude, uh, is let's take x and x prime, both to be um, a Borel modulo its adjoint action, or in other words, Grotendieck Springer uh, space uh, modulo the adjoint action, and then the map to y, so y will be just g mod g. This is the kind of usual Grotendieck Springer alteration. Let's call it mu. Okay, so this sets, sits in the setup of the theorem. These are smooth stacks. This is a proper map, and this is a smooth base. 
Um, maybe I'll decorate everything here with checks, since this is all on the spectral side. Um, and what we find is that the, um, the, uh, the affine HECA category, which is, uh, if you like, uh, by either Bezrukovnikov or by just some definition at this stage, um, is coherent sheaves on this Steinberg fiber product of B check cross B check. So this is equivalent uh, to uh, kind of matrix algebra of functors uh, that are perfect, that are over linear over the base from perfect complexes to perfect complexes. And in fact, this is, this is monoidal. There's a composition on both integral kernels by, by well, kind of module composition, and then also on, on exact functors. So this gives you a kind of a starting point of what is the affine Hecke category all about. The affine Hecke category from its spectral standpoint is just the matrix algebra on this uh, and a vector space over this base. OK, and now um, I'd like to say something about the gluing descent that I mentioned earlier. Okay, so <clears throat> yeah, so um, I'll say something about the the gluing and descent. So gluing or descent. <clears throat> so, uh, with the same setup as up here, we have the following. Or, yeah, no, let me add to the setup. So, we have x and x prime over s. These are all smooth, say. This is proper. And now let's also give ourselves um, z being some fiber product with some w and z prime being a fiber product with some w, uh, sorry, wait one sec. Yeah, let me not have x and x prime. Let me just have x. Uh, thanks. <laughs> OK, uh, so the theorem is that, um, so you can look at coherent sheaves on uh, w cross uh, uh, W prime fibered over S. Um, and this will be equivalent to the following tensor product, coherent sheaves on Z. Sorry? Yeah, thanks. Coherent sheaves on Z tensor over this. Um, yeah, somehow S be Y became S or something. Yeah, OK. Uh, X cross X over S, uh, coherent sheaves on Z prime. OK, so, um, so this is almost true. So what is this saying? I, uh, well, OK. Um, this is almost true. Let me just add some, some phrases here. So here, you need to put some singular support. And here, you also could put some singular support. So I don't want to spell out the, the conditions um, that, that you would find, except for maybe in some, some examples. Okay? So, um, so let me do a, a kind of a favorite example in which I will spell out the, the, the uh, so these are some conditions. These are kind of explicit conditions. Okay, so uh, so here's a here's a favorite example. 
of this, this setup. So let's look at uh, a curve C with a point P, and let's let Z be um, local systems for G check on the curve minus P, or Betty local systems. Betty local systems on the curve uh, C minus P, and I'll just put a tilde here to say that they have B, B check reduction. So we have a G check bundle local system with a B check reduction uh, around the, the puncture. Um, and similarly, if we have some other curve, call this point P, C prime, G check, B check, we have a similar Z prime. OK, so the kind of spectral Verlinda formula. What's that? What's Tilde means uh, G check local system with a B check reduction around the, around the point. Is there a question? So the spectral Verlinda formula is just the gluing that um, coherent sheaves with no potent singular support uh, on this guy. Betty, loc, G check, C minus P, tensor over the uh, affine Hecke category uh, with coherent sheaves, no potent singular support on the other. So tildes. Um, is, in fact, coherent sheaves with no potent singular support on what you get when you glue. So C. I don't know, C prime, P. Oh, sorry, Betty local. OK, so I didn't tell you in general what the singular support conditions are, but in this situation, it is just uh, no potent singular support. OK, um, okay so let me state one uh, further special case of this which uh, David asked for earlier, which is the calculation of the Hochschild homology, or Drinfeld co-center of the affine Hecke category um, in its kind of spectral realization. So a kind of uh, special case. So a special case of this is that um, the Drinfeld co-center of H F G is uh, coherent sheaves with no potent singular support on uh, Betty local systems on a uh, genus one curve. Okay. Okay. OK, so maybe I'll just talk for another five or 10 minutes. I don't know. Um, so I want to go on to the third part. So this is kind of the, this is the conclusion of what I wanted to tell you about uh, kind of spectral Verlinda formula. So the, uh, I, sort of, I hope stated enough to give you the impression that uh, in this Betty Langlands game, the spectral side is kind of completely controlled by these atomic pieces and some, some, some kind of gluing formalism. OK. so. Um, so what's missing, just to remind you, in, in, in general, is um, either is, is understanding, I mean, this, this extra atomic block is, is key, and also the kind of automorphic gluing. So I want to advertise that I think the, I, I believe the automorphic gluing will be, given kind of natural structures in the story, I believe it will be a kind of a, f a formal result once, um, uh, I don't know smarter people get their hands on it. But what I'm going to tell you um, is some kind of beautiful geometry in genus one that I think is interesting in its own right that also helps uh, you understand the gluing uh, on the automorphic side. Automorphic gluing is the exact same kind of assertion which says that if I give you sh sheaves with no point singular support on Bungie with uh, Iwahori level structure, that if you take two of them and you tensor them over the affine Hecke category, you get sheaves with no potent singular support. On. OK.
Okay, so I'm gonna kind of give a very kind of quick uh, kind of invitation to think about some beautiful geometry that uh, I learned most of it from uh, Pangui, who's here. Um, so uh, I feel bad that I, I, well, okay. So this is sort of part three. So this is some genus one tools. I'm gonna talk about uniformization. Okay, so our goal, just to remind everyone, our goal is a kind of a Verlinda formula, or uh, gluing, gluing result, which would say that sheaves with no potent singular support on bungee of an elliptic curve is affine character sheaves. Okay, so this was the kind of, just the, for the sake of this talk, this was by definition the, the Hochschild homology. So this was the kind of algebraic uh, gluing, just so Hochschild homology or Drinfeld cocenter. Okay, so we're trying to identify some geometric category with um, with uh, an algebraic construction, and the basic picture, just to draw in this case, is we start with an elliptic curve. So here's an elliptic curve E, and we degenerate it to a nodal curve. Okay, and then we pull apart the node. Okay, and what we see is, if you like, by following, say, nearby cycles and then pulling back, you get a map from this uh, sheaves with no potent singular support on bungee of E to uh, the affine Hecke category. Okay, so our goal is to try to see that this kind of map can be universally characterized in terms of the Hochschild homology of the affine Hecke category. Okay, so the first thing we need um, before we can even do this is we need to confirm, confirm the original ansatz. So we need that sheaves with no potent singular support on bungee of E is topological. Okay, so um, so I'd like to give a kind of the key geometry in one in one proof, um, which um, uh, I learned mostly from Pangui. So uh, geometry of one proof. So I say one proof because I imagine this kind of assertion in the right hands, looking at you, Dennis, would be a kind of formal statement that, I don't know, sheaves with no potent singular support would be kind of locally constant. But Okay, so uh, geometry of one proof is a kind of non-abelian uniformization, kind of analytic, a tall uniformization of, um, of bungee of E, or at least its semi-stable degree zero locus. So let's call this G sub E. Okay, um, so we want a kind of analog of the Tate uniformization that when G equals GM that pick zero of uh, the elliptic curve equals C star mod Q to the Z. Okay. Okay, so I'd like to just dr draw some pictures and I'll quit. Um, so one, uh, well, okay. So one interesting aspect is here, well, okay, yeah, maybe I won't say. <laughs> okay. So let me just, just sort of draw some pictures in the first example. So example, G equals SL2. So just by kind of analogy, I'd like to remind you what does uh, GE look like. Okay, so it's an analogous to G or it's Lie algebra. So there's a kind of zero loop, one loop, two loop kind of pattern. Um, so this maps down to H mod W, this maps down to 
H mod W, and this has a coarse moduli, which is um, E tensor uh, over Z lambda H mod W. So in this situation, we see A1 with a special point zero. In this situation, we see A1 with two special points, one and minus one. And in this situation, we see P1, I don't know, P1 with uh, four special points. I don't know, zero, one, okay, there's a formula I don't know, and then infinity. Okay. Um, okay, and just to remind you that you understand the geometry above these loci. So, um, so here, above uh, the point zero, you see the no potent cone, and everywhere else you see a kind of uh, semi-simple conjugacy class. Here you see two sort of unipotent cones, one based at minus one, one based at one, and then you see similarly regular ones. And here you see the kind of uh, four kind of versions of the Atia bundle on an elliptic curve. So you see four copies of this. Um, and then everywhere else, uh, regular moduli. Okay, so this picture, very, very well known, um, but uh, so what we would like to do is understand that she is with no potent singular support on say this space is locally constant as we move the modulus of the elliptic curve. So as these four points move around. Okay, so, um, so the tool that we can use is kind of uniformization so this is kind of via the uh, twisted adjoint quotient of the loop group. Um, and in this case, so uh, just in this case, it looks like the following. Um, GE can be written as a kind of a quotient, or kind of is, is covered by, um, by the adjoint quotients Q regular of um, of two groups, and let me just tell you what those those groups are. So G zero and G one are both inside the loop group, and G zero is just the constant loops A B C D, and G one are uh, these kinds of loops. So of course these kind of subgroups um, are, sorry? Yeah, there's a Q here which has to do with E, which I think I'm just going to, I'm, I'm almost done, so I, I, I think I'll just sprint to the finish line. Yeah, I'll just skip this. Uh. Okay, so, um, so there's a general, so this is just in the example, so example continued. There's a very beautiful picture worked out by Pangui of how to, how to um, uniformize this moduli. And from this uniformization, um, you can see that this category of sheaves with nilpotent singular support is, is, is locally constant. So that allows you to play this game. It allows you to degenerate the elliptic curve to this nodal curve. And you can check, it's kind of not difficult, you can check that this actually gives, uh, at the end of the day, um, a functor between the um, the automorphic elliptic category and the spectral elliptic category. And now you just need to check that some diagram actually is, is uh, that this, actual, this augmentation actually is kind of the limit or co-limit of this diagram. And um, like I said, I think that'll follow from some formal arguments, uh, but uh, not today. Okay, thanks very much.